Hello, Elon Musk. <laughs> we see your name, but we can't see you. Are you on the line? Oh, there he is. Wonderful. OK. Hey, Elon, thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. And, and I apologize. I think there's a bit of lag going on, because I, I think it might be as much as a two second lag. So just I'm in Italy at a friend's wedding. So. Oh, my gosh. Well, thank you for making time for us. Hey, Elon, I want to start, first of all, has anyone ever shared with you that you're like the best combination of Henry Ford and Thomas Edison all wrapped up in one? Has that analogy been made before? I'm not sure that exact analogy has been made. certainly would be a flattering. Thing. Well, that's how so. I feel today. That's how I feel today, <laughs> Elon. We're making history here together, and you're joined by hundreds of people here in San Ramon, California, but thousands of people across the globe have joined in for our conversation today. So, so thank you for that. We're talking a lot today, Elon, about breakthrough thinking and what it means to stand for something that you believe is possible in the face of potentially resistance. Maybe people don't think that it's possible. And I'm curious, Elon, if you can think back, when was the first time you had a thought that something was possible that no one else believed? Well, I'm not sure that, that no one else believed, but because I mean, there's usually somebody, somebody that believes something, however preposterous that might be. But let's say when most people didn't believe it or, or, or didn't think it was true, obviously, I think electric vehicles would certainly put into that category. So, yeah, I wouldn't say that nobody, you know, we're looking to say electric vehicles and reusable rockets. I think most people did not think that would happen. A few did, obviously, but most people did, did not. For me, the, the technology, it, it seemed quite obvious from a physics standpoint. You know, if you look at an internal combustion engine car, it needs an electric motor and a battery just to start. So it's an incredibly complicated device, you know, combustion engine car. And the only reason bat battery cars did not take off was range. So as soon as you have something with high energy density like lithium ion, and you have now a range that, it, that matches people's needs, then th there's really no need for the complexity of an electric car, for, of a gasoline car. So, you know, like a lot of people think that the origins of like my interest in, in electric vehicles would be environmental, but actually my concern was simply that we will run out of hydrocarbons to mine and burn. And so we need something to continue civilization, in, independent of any environmental issues. So, and we are moving at this point, I think quite rapidly towards an electric future and towards towards a sustainable future. So, you know, I'm fairly encouraged on that front. I think it's going to happen. It is happening. You know, we can always make it go faster. That would be good. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm not actually in favor of sort of vilifying the oil and gas industry. You know, we still obviously need that in order to for civilization to function. But we should be transitioning to a sustainable energy as quickly as we reasonably can. But I think, like I said, without vilifying oil and gas. Well, and I think that really hits on some of the things we're talking about today, Elon. And the work that Tesla and pg and &E are doing together, just a couple uh, props. As I say, I'm leading with love, but I got to show some real love for the Tesla team, Elon. You know, our partnership on our Elkhorn battery storage, 182 megawatts of power packs, put in a really smart yeah. location adjacent to the transmission system that existed from an old steam plant really has been a perfect complement to the abundant solar that we have and the duck curve that exists. You know, we're working on all sorts of things together yeah. in that vein. I'd love to know where yeah. you think the grid is going and where, you know, obviously you've made some really big predictions about the three times increase in energy demand yes. as a result of electrification. What do you think the role of the grid is in that future? Yeah, I mean, to be precise, like if one looks at total energy consumption globally, in very rough terms, only about a third of it is like electricity, you know, and then a third of it is burnt for transport with hydro, you know, aircraft, boats, cars and stuff. And then a third of it is for heating. So even if you assume that electricity demand is static, in order to transition to a sustainable energy future where everything is electric and sustainably electric, we need a tripling of electrical output. So you can mark my words here, electrical output will triple. So now, as you alluded to there, because of the way that the grid has been constructed to match peak demand, there's actually there is actually excess capacity if you run the plants sort of 24 hours a day. I'm not sure it, it might be as much as a 2x gain, or but it's at least 50 to 100 percent increase in total energy output if power plants are run 24/7 versus just matching the consumer demand. And and obviously the reason for that is there hasn't been really in most cases a way to buffer energy. And what stationary battery packs like the Tesla Mega Pack enable is to buffer the energy. So you can essentially run the, the power plant at, at its max power output and, and fill up the battery pack and then use it as needed. So this effectively gives far greater output potential for the existing electricity generation infrastructure. Yeah, and you uh, know, Elon, we are very excited about that. 
And we actually together got to do a little demonstration last summer. You'll remember we had the peak event in September of 22 <clears throat> here in California. And as a result of the integration with the already, I call it anyways economics, the power walls that people had purchased already in their garages right. across California, we delivered, well, Tesla delivered through our grid, 50 megawatts of supply in the peak hours of those peak days. And that's just a start. That was like something we thought together and thanks to the te Tesla's nimble approach and our ability to yeah. keep pace, we were able to deliver that last. We're continuing to do that now. In fact, last week, my power wall in my garage, you'll be happy to know, uh. was tapped and uh, that was good news. We're supplying right. distributed storage to the grid. What do you think the full extent of distributed storage and particularly with the idea of bi-directional charging vehicles, Elon, what's your thought on that? Yeah, I, I think there's a uh, buffering that is needed, obviously, at the power plant level, the sort of heavy and heavy industry utility level, which is the mega pack. And then there's also energy buffering that is useful at the end point, at the consumer's home or the individual business. I think we're basically need to tackle this problem. I, I, like, if I leave with one, one message is that the magnitude of the energy problem that lies ahead is absolutely enormous. It's, it's news for the utility industry. It's great news. People are going to use a lot of electricity, like a lot. He likes the sound of that, Elon. We like that. Yeah, so this is for sure going to happen. We're, in order to satisfy the electricity need of a fully electric transport economy and electric heating, it's you've got to triple out. And that's just in America. I mean, places that are industrializing like India, I think it probably is a 10x output. You know, so in, in fact, a friend of mine talked to me about like, like some of these sort of, sort of fundamental ratios or metrics that, that are interesting to think about. One of them is a total amount of energy per person. And you can include thermal energy and electrical energy and and how that has scaled over time is incredible. So, you know, if you, if you said like before this, before the steam engine, you basically just had energy per person would be like, what can you burn with like firewood or a horse or an ox? So this is obviously not much. Now the energy, if you say total sort of human civilization created energy is, is gigantic compared to the past. And th that number per person is going to increase, I think, dramatically over time. This friend of mine that I referred to thinks that w we, we may end up at some point, well, if the trend continues, that it might end up being like a terawatt per person. And I'm not showing it, like, terawatt per person is a lot, obviously. That'd be a lot. So, so yeah. you know, a big asterisk around if trend yeah. continues. Yeah. But, if, but energy per person over time, it looks like a wall at the industrial revolution. The same can be said for compute per person over time, the digital versus biological compute. These are really interesting metrics. So, so basically you know, what I'm saying is we need to tackle this from, from all angles. So that's power wall locally, some amount of local solar power. It just helps a little bit so that, you know, one doesn't have to expand as many substations and build, you know, as many transmission lines, which drive people crazy in, in like suburban neighborhoods. <laughs> Elon, I think you're talking about something really important, especially for this audience. One of our points Points of view that we share in our R&D document. We published an R&D document, Elon, that lists 70 from today to the future. And one of them yeah. is talking about the full utilization of our existing assets. And we have a point of view that the decarbonization of our economy at the lowest societal cost requires a much more optimized grid than exists today. And today, we, as you mentioned, you know, we build the whole system for those peak hours plus 15%. And so if we can fully yeah. leverage the distributed resources on those peak hours. Now the sun stops shining when the sun stops shining. And sure. so we need a resource and that's where Elkhorn and the mega packs and the residential power packs can play a role as well as EVs can help to bring down that peak and not just as we add three times more energy usage, not just add to the peak, but in fact, if we can add to the peak less and fill the belly of the duck, as we say more, then we can get a more fully utilized energy grid, which could in fact be more affordable for customers. They actually could spend less on energy. What is your point of view about that? You can disagree if you want, Elon. I, know, I think there will be price pressure on electricity because when you increase demand, there tends to be pricing pressure on something, on whatever, wherever it may be. But you know, the good news is with the batteries at scale, either like, like the mega pack sort of you know, where you do sort of gigawatt hour class, you know, battery packs, or the summation of power walls at users' homes where it's all communicate. You can have 10,000 power walls all operating together to buffer the power. This, this is going to be extremely helpful 
market and increasing total electricity availability because it, you have just have to buffer it, especially with re renewables, obviously with wind, wind and solar, the buffering is essential. So I mean, if, if you like to say like SpaceX and Starlink satellite constellation, which is a majority of all satellites currently in operation, they're all solar battery powered and they're in low Earth orbit. So they go through Earth's shadow. You can think of Earth as just really a big satellite. The, my prediction is that the long term, most electricity will be generated with solar and with a solar battery combination. You, you just the, the solar energy is just absurdly gigantic with, with a, you know, a gigawatt of solar incidence per square kilometer, roughly. Or, or thought of another way, when you do all the math, it, it sort of roughly works out to like a gigawatt hour per day day, if I recall correctly, per square kilometer. It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we should react. Yes, it's a lot. I mean, it would be a frozen ice ball at, at roughly three degrees Kelvin if it wasn't for the sun. It would be pitch dark and cold as hell. Fortunately, <laughs> it's not. Yes, right. Fortunately, we have the sun, which is throwing off absurd amounts of energy, and, it, and it's zero maintenance, and it just shows up every day. It's amazing. Yes. People always like, what do you think about fusion? I'm like, we have a fusion reactor in the sky that just yeah. shows up every day. Why do you need to build one on the ground? That doesn't make any sense. Elon, with that thought, and as you imagine the energy system of the future, what role do you think, I'm going to bring it back to just kind of practical terms here, so I'm sorry for that, but, but what do you think the role of the grid and a utility like PG&E is in causing that lowest cost societal transition to a decarbonized economy? What do you think our role is and what advice do you have for us? Well, I think generally leaning in the direction of solar and wind combined with battery storage because of, of the intimate nature of solar and wind is the general the right approach. And I think a lot of that is happening. I mean, we see the, the growth of renewables in the United States and, and actually in most places in the world, including China, is, is very high. So if, if that trend continues and probably will, then, you know, basically I think we're headed for a good place. I, I would just say whatever your demand predictions are for electricity, I suspect they are too low. Yeah. I, I, I recommend... I'm taking a note, Elon. Yeah. So, Elon, I know you kind of have a love-hate relationship with artificial intelligence. On one hand, you love it. On one hand, well, it's sense. scary. What role do you think AI has in this grid of the future and the, elect the energy system of the future? Yeah, I, I would say just that I'm worried about AI as, you know, it's just if you've got some sort of digital super intelligence, things can go wrong. Potentially, you know, it's just something we should not be cavalier about. We should be careful with digital superintelligence. It, digital superintelligence may be the biggest existential risk that humanity has ever faced. That's what, so. I think we need to be very careful with it, and I think we should have a reg, we should have regulatory oversight because it is a potential danger to the public. And whenever we have something that is a potential danger to the public, uh, we have regulatory oversight. So, so on, on the plus side, I mean, it has the potential for creating a society of abundance. So in the positive scenario, there, there will be no shortages of goods and services. There, there, there will be almost free. It's a strange way to think about it, but I recommend reading Ian Banks, the culture books. That's probably the best future envisioning of AI that I've seen. But yeah, digital superintelligence combined with robotics will essentially make goods and services close to free in the long term. Yeah, long -term. and I think they should be invisible for sure and easy and automated. And so actually we've got Schneider Electric and Microsoft here in the room. They're going to be talking about our partnership on our distributed energy resource management system and how important that is to make those the optimized, I think of that as the optimized grid, that those services happen very invisible that outages are a thing of the past because our resources are more dynamic than that and they're optimized in some way to provide service where required. And we're very excited about that. Elon, I've got you know a whole host of people here. I'd love to take a question from the audience and then I'm going to do a speed round with you. You okay for a couple sure. more minutes? That's good, sure. Okay, all right. Let's take a, a question from the audience. I think I have one here in the front row, please. I've got Scott Harden here from Schneider Electric. And he has a, a question for you, Elon. Thank you, Patty. Elon, uh, Scott Hart, CTO at Schneider Electric. W one of the things that I'm delighted to hear in your conversation with Patty is the partnership that you have established here. And I think that's unique uh, in the industry. And we have a very similar partnership with PG&E, and, and we think it's incredibly important because as we drive forward with energy transition, it's going to be partnerships like this that are going to truly move the needle. What I'm curious about is, from your perspective more broadly, what is working with other utilities, what is not working, and what could we do collectively 
to essentially facilitate greater collaboration like we see here? Well, I, th I think just generally calibrating expectations for electricity demand is, is very important. You, you know, if, if, you if you have a fairly static electricity demand, which has been the case in the U.S. for a while, it's, it hasn't changed a lot, th then having projects take a long time is okay in that scenario. But in a rapidly changing scenario where electricity demand is increasing, we have to move much faster. So, so the really, we need to bring the timescale of project in sooner and have a, a high sense of urgency. So, uh, so that's my, my biggest concern is that there's, there's insufficient urgency and, and, and people just don't understand how much electricity demand there will be. And it, it's, it's really going, like I said, it's B times where it currently is. That is great so, advice. I mean, I think well, we are definitely taking a note here. I'm going to be the last person to doubt your predictions of the future. So, But I really think that is very important takeaway for us at pace of change and why we've written this 10-year strategy. It's not a 50-year strategy. It's a 10-year strategy. And that means we have to have a grid that is ready for the demand that electrification will bring and having a, a regulatory construct that enables that and an engineering team who goes from of a mindset of operate and maintain to a mindset of growth. And in an yeah. industry that has had limited growth over the lifetimes of the engineers who have worked for our companies, that's a big change. That's a big change. Yeah. I'm just curious, Elon. I'm going to fish for a compliment here. Anything pg and is doing good? Uh -huh. Anything we're doing well with you, Elon? Well, I think we've had a number of really productive projects. You know, the, the big battery installations have been great. And just generally, the dialogue has, has been really good between our teams. And the, I appreciate the help with the power wall, with the backup switch which is really helpful for, you know, if customers do get caught in a wildfire, or for some reason electricity is down, then the, we need to cut off the home power from the grid so, so it's contained, so that, it, that the power wall can power the house. So it's actually important from a safety standpoint and everything, and, and I appreciate your, your help in, in enabling that. That's a big deal for people in need. Yeah, thank you, Elon. Thank you for finding something good to say. I appreciate that. You had to dig deep. Okay, okay, Elon, we're gonna do a speed round now. We're gonna do a speed round, something overrated. What's overrated? I mean, some of these things that are overrated are obvious at this point, like, you know, Web 3.0 or whatever, and NFTs, but everybody knows that. Okay, that's uh, good. That's good. Me, How I'm overrated. Nice, nice. Okay, so tell us something that you're excited about for the future. What's something that excites you for the future, Elon? Well, I think it would be very exciting to see humanity back on the moon and to have the first people on Mars. And of course, to be a space for civilization, I think that would be a very exciting future. You know, I think we are moving towards sustainability, and I think that'll make everyone a lot more comfortable as we move to a sustainable energy future. You know, on the positive side of AI, I think there will be some amazing things that, that AI creates for us. That's Those are all very yeah. exciting things, Elon. And you know, when I think about, there was a, a, well, I often think that if Thomas Edison came and took a walk with me today, he'd recognize most of the stuff, uh, but not for long. And yeah. in no short order because of you, Elon, and your vision and your commitment to a future that was not true when you stated it the first time. You had a lot of doubters. We talked a little bit before you joined about the Golden Gate Bridge and how there were a lot of doubters about the Golden Gate Bridge. And now we can't imagine a world without it. I can't imagine a world without Tesla. And I'm so thankful for your leadership. We're thankful for your partnership. We at PG&E are dedicated to being with you. And we're going to do our darndest to keep pace with you. And we're thank always going to listen closely when you give us good advice. So, so thank you so much for being with us. Please, everybody, give it up. For thank you. Very, very kind of you.